All right, final lecture for this section. Um, and then next week we'll do smoking cessation and talk about geriatrics. And then that'll be the final two lectures. We'll go over some review stuff next week as well. All right. All right, so what are sedative hypnotics? I think uh, common society would refer to these as downers, used for a lot of indications, anxiety, sleep, seizures, and sedation. Um, three major properties, so sedation, which has a calming effect and is an anxiolytic, and hypnotic, which induces sleep. So calm, so I guess that's really two major properties. <laughs> I feel like I'm missing something there. Well, maybe I just can't count. Um, commonly prescribed, commonly abused, and commonly overdosed on. I've got Heath Ledger here, and he was uh, notoriously overdosed. He um, had a number of benzodiazepines in his system, in addition to alcohol and opiates. Now, the thing is, is that uh, most sedative hypnotics by themselves, if you overdose on them or take too many of them, they just make you really sleepy. You usually don't die. They don't really suppress your breathing. Um, now, if you combine them with other things, specifically alcohol and definitely with opioids, that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Okay, so we talked about benzodiazepines a lot. Let's talk about them in detail now. So um, benzodiazepines are controlled substances. They're Schedule IV. Uh, the variety of effects depends on the agent. So think of them as having a on the sedation to anxiolytic spectrum. Some of them work more as sedatives and some of them work more as anti-anxiety medications and then they can function anywhere in between. They work really quickly. Um, they can cause physical dependence which may lead to addiction. So that means that the more or the longer term you take them, the likely the larger dose you're going to need to get the same effect. Pretty safe when used in short term or as needed as long as people aren't taking them regularly. Ideally, you don't have anyone ever taking a benzodiazepine chronically, but sometimes that does happen. Pharmacology. Benzodiazepines bind to a subset of specific receptor types, chloride channels, um, and they potentiate the ability of GABA to open the chloride channel, which causes an inhibitory effect. So they're basically manipulating the body to have a more enhanced inhibitory process within the central nervous system, which causes the relaxation, the sedation, and the disinhibition you see with um, sedative hypnotics. <clears throat> GABA is GABA aminobutyric acid. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And again, this just basically describes what I just said in words versus the picture. And these are all your benzodiazepines and the different pharmacology you have. So this is something that, depending on what practice you work in, but you're probably going to see benzos prescribed for a variety of indications. I would be relatively hesitant to prescribe benzos to anybody. Uh, make sure you have a good indication for them. Um, I'll give you a personal example, which I don't know if I should share this, but I'm going to anyway. My my wife was applying, my wife works for Target, and she um tends to get anxiety before job interviews, like a lot of people do, but pretty bad anxiety about job interviews. And so she was um, talking to uh, her, I can't remember what the provider was, but she was talking to her provider and they were, they recommended taking Xanax, which I mean, okay, so <laughs> I'm just thinking about this. You, you want somebody to take a Xanax before a job interview. And so she did it. And I think she kind of tanked the job interview. And I'm laughing a little bit because basically it's like, you know, drinking before going on a job interview. I mean, you're, you're going to slow your psychomotor processing and you're not going to be as sharp as you would otherwise. So yeah, I mean, they have situational uses, but that's not probably a good one. So again, my use my story as a words of warning that if you're going to tell somebody to take a benzodiazepine to reduce anxiety situationally, make sure you tell them to use it appropriately. So a better way to have used that, let's turn this into a positive, could have, the provider should have said, hey, Janae, that's my wife's name, take this at night before the interview so you can get a good night's sleep but don't take any during the day prior to the interview that probably would have been a more appropriate use of the benzodiazepine if you were having trouble sleeping maybe because you felt so anxious going into the interview so there's a some just some words of wisdom there i think you need to be careful with how people use these because people shouldn't operate cars they shouldn't use machinery they shouldn't probably be functioning in in a job where they have to be you know like if you're taking care of patients for example in healthcare probably shouldn't be taking a benzodiazepine during the day. Now, there are situations where people might tolerate them just fine because they've been on them or they're used to the effects and they don't sedate them anymore, but it is a very fine line there. And again, just be cautious with them. So understanding the different doses, different potencies, and different half-lives is really important for practice. I'm not going to test you on them other than to put them in some general groups. So 
what I'd like you to know is that chlorodiazepoxide and diazepam, for example, have really long half-lives. So they have tons of active metabolites, which means that the actual drug gets metabolized quickly, but there's all these active products that take the liver forever to process. Um, and so if you have somebody on diazepam, it sort of self-titrates. So if you've been on diazepam for a week, it's going to stay in your system for quite a bit of time once you stop it. So you can stop a diazepam cold turkey mostly, and it's going to kind of self-titrate it down in the body because of the active metabolites. Alternatively, you have something like lorazepam or alprazolam. Um, I would, I don't know, uh, this seems a little bit long. Alprazolam's probably got a little bit shorter of a half-life than this. It's a fairly fast-acting um, benzodiazepine. It's not quite as sedating as other ones. Um, lorazepam is also reasonably fast acting too, but and uh, clonazepam is the other one I'd put in that group as all the um, short or acting, and they call these intermediates, but still the, the thing, and we'll talk about these onsets and, and the differences here too, but the point is is that you have cool. So let's talk about alprazolam, clonazepam, and lorazepam as sort of your short intermediate acting. You've got I don't care about oxazepam. Um, Fluoridiazepoxide and diazepam are your long-acting ones. And then you have these ones down here, which are just sedatives, basically. They, don't, they aren't used for anxiety. They aren't used for other things like these products do. And these products have some different indications outside of anxiety we'll talk about. All right, so general side effects are going to be across the class. Short-term low doses, people are going to, might experience some euphoria, sedation, shallow breathing, coordination issues. Um, Short-term high doses, uh, paranoia, aggression, ir ag agitation, irritability, poor memory, and cognition. Um, <clears throat> and you have long-term use, rebound anxiety with less efficacy, tolerance, which can lead to physical dependence, withdrawal risk, um, overdosing on them, heavy sedation, mild respiratory depression, likely not enough to, again, be fatal um, unless there's something else going on. Uh, metabolic concerns. So LOT are lorazepam, oxazepam, and temazepam, and these don't have any active metabolites, minimal drug interactions, and are not renally dose adjusted. So those are the that's an acronym that people um, use a lot. So if you want to use like a benzodiazepine in the elderly, maybe lorazepam is one that you would consider over some of the other ones. Um, I'll talk about withdrawal risk in a little bit. I'm just saying that as a mental note so that I don't forget it completely. Um, I think I've got a special slide on that. So benzodiazepines as anxiolytics. Basically, you're looking at these four drugs as being the most popular ones. So alprazolam, clon uh, clonazepam, lorazepam, diazepam. And again, we talked about some of these different ones where diazepam is sort of the oddball here. Um, I think alprazolam generally, even though on the this slide, I've seen other sites where it says it's about more like an eight-hour half-life. It's a little bit. I think it's a shorter-acting one than the other ones. But basically, let's put these three all in the same group. I would say that lorazepam is probably going to be the most sedating out of these, and alprazolam would be the least sedating. So if you're going to give somebody an anxiolytic for like to use if they get a panic attack or um, if they have a you know, some sort of anxiety disorder and you're trying to treat it over time, but you, you need something to bridge the gap before your antidepressant like your SSRI kicks in. Alprazolam is probably the one that's used pretty commonly. Um, clonopin is, is also a popular choice. Ativan I'd probably avoid just because it's more sedating, um, but it's a little bit longer acting. Again, bridge to therapy. SSRIs take weeks to work. These can help with an anxiety disorder, at least Somebody can use them as needed for panic attacks in the meantime until their SSRIs fully kick in. Um, oops, sorry, typo. Let's say alprazolam or clonazepam, preferred agent. Maybe useful as a combination sleep aid, possibly. These drugs just aren't as sedating as some of the other ones. So for sleep aids, I don't know if I would recommend them, but um, just because... The, toler the tolerance effects they have and things like that. I don't know if that's really an appropriate way to use them, but you do see them used as sleep aids. Careful with driving or operating machinery. Uh, cognitive impairment may not function mentally as well as normally. Short-term memory loss and confusion are all things that are uh, side effects with even uh, one-time use of benzodiazepines. All right, sleep aids. Got a couple drugs here, temazepam and triazolam. Um, temazepam is a long-acting benzodiazepine. It's not renally cleared, and it's used primarily as a sleep aid. It's not used for anxiety at all. Um, triazolam is a really old drug, and the only reason I put it on here is because there's this interesting 
court case a long time ago that somebody actually said they murdered their, I think they murdered, some woman murdered her husband on um, triazolam, and she claimed that she was sleepwalking and was unaware of it. So this drug got this bad rap that's like, yeah, you could, um, and I think there was a, a couple other case reports, maybe a suicide on triazolam, and people um, think it has a much stronger component of memory loss than some of the other ones, and a higher potential, potential, uh, potential for sleep-related activities that the user is unaware of. Um, these drugs aren't as popular anymore because we have a lot of new sleep agents that are that we're going to get to here in a second. But technically, any benzodiazepine should relax somebody and help with sleep. These ones are going to be more heavily sedating, though. I would avoid them unless you really need them. We'll talk about sleep here in a few slides and, and kind of some of those strategies. But yeah, I would probably not use these generally. You do see them occasionally. I see temazepam more often than it probably should be prescribed. Okay, um, benzodiazepine-like hypnotics, uh, sleepers or Z drugs are maybe some of the common names for these. They're structurally dissimilar to benzos, but they're mechanistically quite similar. They're more selective for the specific subtype for a specific subtype on the benzodiazepine receptor. And they um, are sleep specific, thought to enhance GAB activity, responsible for inhibitory processes that cause sleep. Three drugs Zolpiclone, Zolpidem, and S Zolpiclone. Um, Sonata, Ambien, and Lunesta. Probably everybody on the planet's heard of Ambien. Um, all those drugs are fairly similar. Uh, they just vary in their half life. Um, and Lunesta, actually, I think Lunesta is generic now. I'm pretty sure it's generic. They're all generic. Um, so either any one of them are, is likely okay. Ambien comes as a CR form too, which doesn't really have. I have a chart on this next slide showing the Ambien. So Ambien CR is the the dots and regular releases here. So yeah, it's got a nice smoother curve, but honestly, you don't really get that much benefit. This is always kind of a joke that you're like, well, oh yeah, it's so much so much different than the regular one, and really, it's not that much different at all. You really don't get Maybe maybe you get like an extra hour of sleep. Your A your AUC is bigger. I'll give them that, but it's still I don't think it's that warrants the extra cost that Ambient CR comes with. And it's a higher dose too. So you're getting twelve and a half milligrams versus ten. So maybe if you gave twelve and a half of immediate release Ambient, you'd see a bigger response. But anyway, uh, that's just it, it's kind of a funny thing. But I don't think there's really a good reason to prescribe Ambien CR. We don't allow it on hospital formulary, so we just convert everybody to regular Ambien because I don't think really clinically there's a benefit there. Okay, here's some jokes about Ambien. So, oh, I should I think I skipped this bullet point. Side effects: sedation. Obviously, this is causing um, sleepiness. Uh, <laughs> if that's a word. Um, sleep activities is the big one that people report with Ambien a lot. So doing stuff in your sleep, sleepwalking, sleep eating, sleep driving, sleep sex, stuff like that, uh, all are fair game with Ambien. So here's Ambien Walrus. And somebody came up with some jokes. And there's some other ones on the internet that are a little bit less appropriate, uh, but somewhat funny as well. So anyway, come on, come with me on an adventure you'll never remember. And apparently somebody thought a walrus was a good thing to put as, uh, as a representation for Ambien. So uh, here's a guy. He says, well, Ambien Walrus, I guess I can't eat all the cookies in the three-pound family pack. Myth, myth busted. Let's go for a drive. Uh, representing sleep eating and then, you know, bad decisions like driving. Um, here, here's a phone. Call all your ex-girlfriends. Not now, Ambien Walrus. I'm trying to lose my car keys. Uh, people will report misplacing things. They get up in the middle of the night. They move stuff around. Um, phone calls, sure. Yeah, using using electronic devices, fair game. <clears throat> Alternate sleep drugs. Uh, anti <laughs> So um, that's my Ambien Walrus uh, thing. So while we're on the whole thing of sleep, you've got a couple different options we just talked about. You've got Ambien type drugs. You've got the Z, I mean, the, the benzodiazepine like hypnotics. So you've got the, the Z drugs. You've got benzodiazepines themselves like uh, temazepam. Uh, so what do we want to do if we don't want a drug like this? Let's say you want something that doesn't cause sleep disturbances or sleep activities. Um, alternating sleep drugs, or alternative sleep drugs, excuse me. So we talked about a couple of these already. Don't forget, and this is just a good thing to keep in the back of your head as a clinician, because you're going to see people struggle with insomnia in every practice environment. So I, 
I'm a firm believer that we don't have to rush to prescribe Ambien for everybody, but Ambien's not a, a bad drug either. It's, I mean, yeah, some people are going to get this. I think the incidence of sleep activity is around 20%. And a lot of that has to do with sleep walking. When you get these more extreme examples of people driving or cooking meals in their sleep, that's a little, you know, that's a little scary, uh, but it's not very common. Um, okay, so alternatives. We talked about trazodone and mirtazapine already. Um, tricyclic antidepressants in low doses are sedating as well. Um, diphenhydramine is a really commonly used one just because it's over the counter. I highly recommend not having elderly patients take this, but I swear I've seen so many older people come into the hospital and they've got Tylenol PM on their list that they say, oh yeah, I take that every night for sleep. It works great. Like, oh, do you have any issues in the morning? Do you feel dry mouth, constipated? No. Nope. No, I'm fine. All right. So maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But theoretically, there's an anti there's a it's an anticholinergic drug and there's a risk. So I'd I'd recommend avoiding that in most patients because I think there's better drugs here, specifically like um, mirtazapine would probably be one that I would think would be one of the better tolerated ones out there. Melatonin. Tons of people take this. I didn't talk about this during the supplement lecture. Uh, melatonin has a variety of evidence. A lot of people think it's basically placebo. Um, some evidence says it does help with sleep, but I swear 50% of the hospital at any given time takes melatonin for sleep. Uh, so a lot of people take this, you know, whether it works or not, I don't know. I've, I, again, I've heard variable results from it and I've read variable evidence on it. Um, it is over the counter, so people can buy that as well and self-dose that. Um, Remeltian is a melatonin-like drug that's a prescription product. It's an agonist that's specifically at melatonin receptors. And it's supposed to be longer duration and more potent than standard melatonin. Very odd to, to see this prescribed. It's kind of expensive. It's not. It's an unusual medication. However, it isn't a controlled substance, like your um, benzene, like these drugs. I don't think I said this, um, but these are these have the same control status as um, as your benzodiazepines. So they are controlled substances, um, and none of these drugs are, with the exception of this new one. So new agent. It's not a question mark. It is a new agent. <laughs> um, new agent, su uh, Suvorexent, I think is how you say that. It's Belsamra. And uh, the mechanism of this is new, so it's kind of an interesting drug. It's an orexin receptor antagonist. It's a neuropeptide signaling system that promotes wakefulness. Uh, and the idea is it keeps you from waking up instead of the other drugs, which puts you to sleep. That's sort of the idea. But interestingly enough, it's got very similar side effects to benzodiazepines, like sleep activities, and it's not recommended to be used in combination with a benzodiazepine or a benzodiazepine-like hypnotic. So you can't combine it with Ambien. There you go. It's a standalone med. This one's got that really weird ad with the cats and the dog that have words on them. It's kind of creepy. All right. So um, we talked about sleep. Let's talk about the next angle of benzodiazepines. So seizures. Um, benzodiazepines are the first line for stopping seizure activity. Uh, they aren't used or shouldn't be used unless in really extreme cases for maintenance therapy as long-term anti-epileptic drugs. Um, lorazepam and diazepam and midazolam are the three drugs that are the most commonly used for this particular indication. Um, and I'm going to talk about the differences. Every year people get confused on this, so um, rewind and listen to my explanation a couple times if it's not making sense. But um, lorazepam and diazepam are generally the two that you're going to see most commonly used. Lorazepam is generally the gold standard um, uh, for stopping a seizure for most patients. So for example, we stock lorazepam pretty much everywhere in the hospital uh, because anybody could have a seizure really at any, any given point and it's first line, you want to have it available. Um, lorazepam is a lower lip, has lower lipophilicity than a drug like diazepam. So diazepam works great to stop seizures too. However, um, it's not quite as long lasting. Now this gets really confusing because you're like, you just told me diazepam was a long acting uh, benzodiazepine. That's correct. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. Lorazepam is not lipophilic. It takes a longer time, or it's less lipophilic, I should say. So it doesn't get into the central nervous system as quickly. If somebody's having a seizure and you give them a shot of lorazepam, it's going to take a few minutes to see the activity. I've had providers get really impatient with the razepam, like, why isn't it working? Well, it does take a little bit of time. You have to be patient with it. Um, but once it gets into the central nervous system, it stays there a long time. So it doesn't bounce back out. Diazepam, while it has tons of active metabolites and it's going to stay in the system longer, yes, 
It's very lipophilic, which means it's actually going to get into the central nervous system really quickly and stop the seizure. However, I say shorter lasting here as far as its seizure stopping potential because it distributes out of the central nervous system. Then. So what happens is it's lipophilic. It goes across the blood-brain barrier in a high concentration post-dose. It distributes out into other areas of the body all over the place, fatty tissues, etc. And then you lose your seizure stopping ability. So it stops the seizure, which is great, and then it wears off right away, even though it's still in the body. So you might have to redose diazepam, and it's a little bit tricky. With lorazepam, it's much more specific. It's easier to control, and it just has longer-lasting seizure. I'll write this in here, seizure-stopping capability. And it would be the same thing for here. So diazepam has shorter-lasting capability, which, again, has nothing to do with its half-life. It has to do with how lipophilic it is. So hopefully that makes sense. So keep those two things in mind. Seizure stopping activity doesn't have to do with the half-life of the drug. It has to do with how lipophilic it is and how it gets into the central nervous system and then redistributes or not. And lorazepam is the better drug in that case. Now, there is an argument maybe, why don't we use diazepam first and then do a dose of lorazepam on top of that? You could do that. It's just complicated. It makes you're using multiple drugs at that point. Or you can make things really easy and just use Versed. Uh, midazolam is Versed, which is an IV only benzodiazepine. Um, and it's actually gotten a lot of good, it, you can give this IV to stop seizures. But um, where we're seeing a lot of benefit for Versed and good study data on Versed is intranasal. So I put this drawing or this picture up here. What you do to give Versed intranasally is pretty cool. You just pull it out of the IV vial, it's sterile, right? It's IV. Um, and then instead of putting a needle on the end of your syringe, you put this little thing that's got like a foam wedge on it, and it actually atomizes the, the medication um, into a fine mist. Not atomize, that's probably the wrong word. It turns it into a fine mist, and uh, it absorbs through the nasal mucosa, and it works really quickly that way. There's actually been a lot of good trials on that process that show that Versed intranasally works almost as good as like lorazepam IV for stopping seizures. So should we use this? I would love it if you would, if, if our hospital adopted this more frequently because I think it's a really easy way to give the drug. You don't have to get IV access. Um, these drugs, lorazepam IV, requires refrigeration, so it can't be stored at room temperature. Diazepam IV is like on a nationwide shortage. We haven't had it in months. So midazolam is actually probably one of the preferred agents, and it's, it's really good. It's kind of a nice balance between the two. It works fast. It has relatively long-lasting capability. Our Alina EMS carry midazolam as their benzodiazepine of choice because it's so versatile. And um, again, a great drug. Now, lorazepam is your ideal medication, but midazolam is just as good in my opinion. It's a very short-acting benzo, so, and by short-acting, I mean it's got a short half-life. So you do have to redose it more frequently, whereas lorazepam, once it gets in, it's going to stick around quite a while. So that's the disadvantage with Versed, but it does work pretty, pretty darn well, I think, um, and especially for kids uh, where it might be hard to get access. It's a really nice ad advantage. Um, diazepam comes as a rectal formulation as well. It's designed for pediatric use, but like if you're a parent and you have the choice between, let's say your kid has epilepsy, if you're at the mall or out in public, do you want to, you know, pull down the pants of your kid and give them a rectal shot in front of people or pull out some Versed and give them a nasal uh, administration? It's going to be a lot more easy to do that. Um, it's just training people on how to do it and making sure they have access to the correct products. And also you'd have to basically dispense an IV product, which is a little tricky in and of itself. The point is, benzos for seizures, you have three major options. They all work, uh, just slightly different advantages with the different ones. Okay, alcohol withdrawal. Um, the major risk of withdrawing from alcohol is seizures. So benzodiazepines are gonna be preferred for that. And also, um, Alcohol and benzodiazepines have very similar effects on the body, even though they don't quite work the same. They're definitely alcohol has some uh, mechanism on, on potent potentiating GABA's activity, just like benzodiazepines do. So not only do you prevent seizures with the benzos, you slow the withdrawal process or stop it altogether so that the patient's a lot more comfortable as <clears throat> withdrawing from chronic alcohol toxicity or acute alcohol toxicity. Um, 
Hospital protocols may prefer one agent over the other. There's a couple different nationwide studies on different protocols. Uh, the major ones are abbreviated MINDS and CWA, and I can't remember what exactly they stand for. We use the MINDS protocol, and we used to use CWA. CWA is a lorazepam-based protocol. MINDS is diazepam. Uh, and so there's a couple different benefits. Lorazepam is hepatically metabolized. Um, which means that if you have some sort of, uh, um, what am I trying to say? If you have a liver failure on top of the alcohol consumption, which is possible certainly with chronic alcoholics. So with lorazepam having um, hepatic metabolism, it is a live drug, remember, so it doesn't have active metabolites. It's quickly metabolized into its um, inactive component and excreted. So the the idea here is that um, lorazepam generally has pretty predictable kinetics, but in a person with withdrawal and uh, liver toxicity at the same time, uh, it can be tricky because you don't necessarily know how lorazepam is going to respond. Ideally, it doesn't matter a whole lot because you want long-acting benzos here. Diazepam is really nice because it's got so many different liver pathways that it can be metabolized through. Um, even if you have some liver failure on board, eventually it'll get metabolized. And it's not going to affect its half-life all that much because it's so long-acting as it is. Um, Chlordia is epoxide, longer acting with really long uh, metabolites as well. So when we like, we, again, we used to use the lorazepam CWA based protocol at Abbott, and we switched to diazepam or the MINDS protocol. Um, and diazepam and chlordia is epoxide, actually, I throw that in there too, are really nice drugs because, again, you can allow them to build up in somebody and then they sort of taper themselves off. If you gave somebody a bunch of lorazepam, it can be difficult. And if you stop a benzodiazepine, you can um, you can have seizure risk as well. So that's one of the biggest things about chronic benzodiazepine use. And um, it's very similar to alcohol withdrawal, not necessarily the symptoms, but the major risk of seizures is going to happen with benzos too. So if you have a long acting benzo on board, sometimes we have these people on MINDS protocol where they're getting massive doses of, of diazepam, like I won't talk about the dosing because it won't mean anything to you, but a ton. And um, then they end up transferring to mental health and they have to taper them off. It's easier to do a diazepam taper because it's so long acting than a lorazepam taper. Short acting drugs, a lot of times what you end up doing if somebody's on a ton of lorazepam or, or um, even something like somebody's abusing Xanax on the streets, if they're on Alprazolam, what you generally do is convert them to a long acting benzodiazepine and then taper them off of that over time. That's usually the process we go by. All right, elderly patients and benzos. Benzos are always a red flag with elderly patients. Older adults are just more sensitive to it. Uh, Medicare didn't cover benzos for a long time. Now they do cover some with some restrictions. Um, dose is probably the bigger concern than the specific pharmacokinetics of any drug. So it's always about the dose. Um, watch your dosing. Use low doses in the elderly. Um, overuse is an issue as it would be for any age group. I've talked to a lot of psychiatrists who say one of the hardest drugs to get people off of is really low dose benzodiazepines in elderly patients. You've got these older, I always picture an older lady, but it could be a man just as easily, um, on, you know, a couple milligrams of Alprazolam a day and they take it every day and they just, they won't stop. And if you stop them, they get these severe side effects and withdrawal and really high anxiety levels. It's always a, a concern. Um, but uh, overuse in the elderly certainly is an issue, and it's an issue in any group, but um, definitely something to watch out for in the elderly. Um, delirium and dementia logically uh, should be good for symptom management, right, because they should uh, calm people down if they're demented or delirious. Actually, they, they make things worse. So if you give somebody who's delirious a benzodiazepine, you're probably going to exacerbate their delirium. Um, Unless the only the exception is sometimes if you're if you're delir if if you have delirium because you're withdrawing from alcohol that would be different but if it's standard delirium and we'll talk about this a little bit more with ICU cares in the summer um, it's probably going to worsen this situation um, sedation related benzos is responsible for a significant amount of ICU related delirium uh, that's one of the big drugs if we have somebody meeting delirium scores um, we're going to look at benzos it's kind of the first drug to act it's a high correlation with that um, you can treat with haloperidol or other second generation antipsychotics and check for underlying causes and other medications potentially too Okay, withdrawal, just to talk about this again, a number of things that can happen that we don't critically care about. Obviously, these are uncomfortable and problematic. Seizures is the big one. 
Um, so that's the one that can be fail potentially for people. So benzodiazepine withdrawal can be fail. We want to make sure we're not quitting anybody cold turkey off of benzodiazepines. So somebody comes in and on the street they've been abusing, they've been buying, you know, six to ten milligrams of alprazolam a day. That's something we definitely need to keep going in some form while they're inpatient. We can't stop that or they're going to go into a seizure, likely. Uh, reversal. You can reverse the effects of benzo benzodiazepines. It's a controversial thing. And there's a couple good uses for this product called flumazenol or romazicon is the brand name. Romazicon is something people refer to it as a brand name all the time. I prefer flumazenol personally because romazicon sounds like something else to me. I don't know why. Just personal preference. Anyway, uh, flumazenol is a competitive benzodiazepine receptor antagonist. It doesn't do anything else other than compete with benzodiazepine receptors. So it's kind of like Narcan, but for benzos. The risk, of course, is that you're going to precipitate a withdrawal seizure. So I've used this situationally successfully in a couple instances. So for example, when it's used really commonly is recovery from short-term procedural sedation. So they use this in um, like post-anesthesia care a lot. If somebody's coming out of surgery, they might use uh, the CRNA or the anesthesiologist might give them a little bit of flumazenil to help um, get the benzodiazepine off if they're using like midazolam, for example, as their sedative uh, during the case. Um, if somebody took a small dose that caused excess sedation, this happens sometime in the elderly where they'll get prescribed a benzodiazepine for sleep or whatever it might be. They take it, they just get, it zonks them out again, highly sensitive to the effects of the drug. Um, I've had elderly patients where we've given them just a little bit of flumazenil. It's actually worked quite well. Um, One-time overdoses, if you know the person wasn't a chronic overdoser, like let's say somebody got a hold of their friend's drug and you know for sure that they didn't have any prescribed to them or weren't taking it before, which can be really difficult to ascertain. But if you know, again, if you know, if you're pretty sure that it was just a one-time overdose, you can use it to reverse it. It's really chronic use that's really risky and you can't rule that out in some cases. So you err on the side that benzodiazepines, again, an overdose are likely not going to have substantial um, problematic outcomes, especially if you're in an ER getting monitored and your respiratory rates being watched carefully, not a huge risk, uh, but certainly you could use it in some situations to reverse. But with chronic benzo users, somebody has been on X number of milligrams for years and now they've overdosed, that's not somebody to do because you're probably going to induce a seizure if you try and withdraw. Um, if they're over sedated after being treated with a benzodiazepine for a seizure, so let's say you gave somebody way too much lorazepam because you were impatient and didn't wait for it to kick in um, during a seizure, it's uh, something that could be maybe in your mind like, oh, it's a reverse malola. No, please don't do that. You're going to put them back into their seizure. It's better to be over sedated on the uh, benzodiazepine than to be seizing in most cases. So let's keep them on the benzo. All right, tapering, stopper, stopping benzodiazepines. Uh, there's a lot of methods, and I talked about this a little bit. Usually there's a couple different protocols. There's a hospital protocol, which you can do a little bit faster. So like we'll take all their benzodiazepine, what they're consuming, usually convert it to one agent, um, dose reduce it by about 40%, give them that, and then drop their dose by 10% per day. Um, that's hospital only because it's risky. You could seize on that potentially, but theoretically not. Um, <clears throat> Outpatient-wise, consider switching to a long-acting agent like diazepam and then doing a really slow, gradual taper with a lot of outpatient follow. Um, phenobarbital, which we'll talk about here in a second, is an option as well. All right, buspirone is thrown in here randomly. It's kind of an oddball drug. Um, I think I mentioned it briefly during depression, but it's not a benzodiazepine at all. It's a serotonin partial agonist, and it's a dopamine antagonist. It's indicated for generalized anxiety disorder. It's kind of like an alternative to an SSRI or augmentation for depression. It takes about two to six weeks to work, just like any other serotonin drug. Just want to put it on here. It's dosed usually two or three times a day, not the most convenient drug. Used occasionally. Um, don't be surprised if you see it, but I'm not sure of its major role anymore. Um, I, see, I see people occasionally taking a PRN as well, which doesn't really make sense to me. Oh, okay, barbiturates. Uh, these drugs are not commonly used, but we're going to talk about them very quickly. They're kind of similar to benzodiazepines. Think about them as a more potent with benzo with a lot higher side effect profile. They have sedative, hypnotic, and anticonvulsant properties. Um, they cause hypotension, bradycardia, uh, near, with a neurotherapeutic index, and uh, they have some uh, arrhythmic potential as well. Uh, or a pro arrhythmic potential as well. So they can be problematic in an overdose situation, definitely a lot less safe than our benzodiazepines. So pretty much benzodiazepines have 
made phenobarbital and its colleagues and cousins fall out of favor. Um, but phenobarb is IVNPO. It's a Schedule IV controlled substance. Um, tend to be more addictive than your standard benzo. And again, a more potent, dangerous version of a benzodiazepine. Um, other drugs, like, uh, let's see, other barbiturates worth mentioning. Um, sodium thiopental is part of a lethal injection three-drug cocktail. So for the, the cocktail that they use to um, execute people uh, by lethal injection, that is uh, a component of it. Um, you might hear about it going on shortage occasionally, or we can't get sodium thiopental. Well, there's a lot of other products you can use to sedate people. Um, it's not the drug that generally kills somebody. They give somebody massive amounts of potassium chloride, which stops their heart. That's usually the drug that does it. But this is to do it a little bit more humanely, I suppose, to sedate the person. It also decreases respiratory rate as well. Uh, pentobarbital is nembutal, which is um, usually used for animal euthanasia, uh, but it does have some crossover into pop culture. Marilyn Monroe used it. Um, it does have some activity in maybe some anesthesia areas, but it's not a very common one. <clears throat> Butalbital is a short-acting, very low-potency barbiturate, which uh, combines with acetaminophen and caffeine as an option for migraine treatment. We talked about this during migraines. There's other barbitals out there, too, that I'm not really concerned you know anything about. They are, again, very much fallen out of favor when compared to drugs like um, benzodiazepines or even drugs like propofol and dexmedetomidine. We just have sedatives that have much wider therapeutic indexes that are easier to control than um, our barbiturates. I got a question, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, I think it was, or maybe it was a couple of years ago. It's right when Wolf of Wall Street came out. I'll just throw this out there. Somebody asked about quaaludes, um, which are a really old type of barbiturate that um, were shown as being abused in that movie. And I think um, True Detective, they, if you guys have ever watched that show, um, they talk about that as well. Um, so if you're wondering, are those barbiturates? Yes, they are. They're a type of barbiturate. And quaaludes were uh, a drug that isn't made anymore, um, and I don't think they're used. I don't know, maybe you can still find alternatives of them on the black market, but I'm not aware of their um, use in current medicine. Okay, uh, let's talk about alcohol. We talked about alcohol a little bit already. Um, I always, this is kind of my joke, so um, there's <laughs> about the ubiquitous use of alcohol and, and my joke about the Bible here. Um, so my joke is that I always... You know, in my evals, there's that section about how do I link this uh, class to anything Christian related. And it's, it's not, it doesn't come up. I'm not a person who um, tries to interject random faith references into my into my lectures just because I don't think it's always applicable or relevant. Um, and this certainly isn't, it's kind of a joke again. So there's a biblical reference here about drinking alcohol. There you can't, you can't, now you can go and say that Chad had some kind of a biblical reference in his uh, lecture. Here you go. So now you can, you know, put that as a funny comment on your email if you want. But you know, again, this is just kind of a joke. But the point is, is, this is a drug of abuse, of course. People abuse it, but it's got ubiquitous societal use. There's a ton of history. There's a lot of provenance that goes into some of the alcohol making processes, and it's a wide. There's a lot of respect within, and it's it's like a nice double-edged sword, right? There's a lot of respect and tradition and heritage when it comes to consuming alcohol and making alcohol, and some of the processes are really cool and very artistic in the way that people make wines and spirits and beer even. Um, but there's also, you know, the, the downside of it that um, it is a abusive substance. People do get addicted to it, and um, it's the most accessible and socially acceptable way to alter one's consciousness. So um, it's something that people can, I think, get away with longer maybe before it becomes a problem or an apparent problem. Um, whereas like if you do heroin once somebody's, and somebody finds out about it, that's an immediate stigma. If you get really drunk one night, no one really cares, right? So uh, just the, and of course those are two different things. I'm not trying to compare heroin to alcohol directly, but the point is, is that you do see a really substantial amount of, of problems related to alcohol use directly. Um, and uh, in American and European cultures especially, we have a, a long-storied history of uh, making alcoholic beverages and consuming them, whereas in other cultures like Hindu and Muslim cultures, it's it's against their, a lot of times it's against religious practices to uh, consume alcohol. So culturally, it just depends on where you're at as well. It could make a big difference between um, how many people are consuming alcohol or not. All right, because I like random stats, <clears throat> percentage of adults who binge drink, I'm not sure. This is a New York Times and CDC comp compilation of data. Uh, so, you know, if we look back at our healthiest people chart that I showed you, or least depressed people, that was what it was, 
Um, it's the same states that binge drink the most. So are we drawing a correlation here? Um, no, and for the record, and because this is recorded and on the internet, no, I'm not saying that people who binge drink are healthier. But it is interesting that it is kind of the same group of states that are less depressed but binge drink more. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just the cold weather. Who knows? But higher percentages versus like in the south um, and the coast, but the east coast tends to have, I don't know, it seems like the latitude. It's really interesting. Northern states. I don't know. There you go. Uh, okay. Uh, per capita consumption of alcohol on the U.S., is sort of an uh, uh, amalgam, uh, or the Americas, I say, is sort of an amalgam of alcohol consumption. It's a moderate one. Of course, Europe, you're going to see higher rates. Culturally, it's just been, again, something that's been done more often. And then, of course, in the Muslim states, much lower. Um, India, uh, a lower states too. And then Southeast Asia is a bit of a mix as well. A lot of Muslim influence in Indonesia, uh, but some variability there as well. Uh, chemistry. Uh, ethanol uh, is ETOH. It's a very simple molecule. <clears throat> Production, yeast, and sugar and water create CO2 and ethanol. Um, the ceiling for alcoholic beverages is usually around 10 to 15 percent. So most times when you're talking about a serving of alcohol, it depends on what you're looking at. So of course, spirits can be much higher. Distilled spirits can be much higher for um, their percentage of alcohol. Um, some beers can use augmented yeast strains, like there's a beer called Sam Adams Utopia that releases that reaches 29% alcohol by volume, which is almost makes it more of a liquor than a beer, but technically it is beer. Um, and there's a lot of different products. Ultimately, it's it's the same type of fermentation process. You're just using different grains or different yeast strains or whatever it may be to achieve the different products and different um, and different flavors you're going for. So ultimately, uh, surveys of alcohol, we'll get back to that in a second. But ethanol pharmacology is not really well understood. Again, I, I said that it's very likely to be similar to benzodiazepines. It makes sense. Similar effects, disinhibition, sedation um, are very common with benzos, very common with alcohol. It's not all that different. It's a CNS depressant. Um, NMDA receptor antagonism, too, can create sort of a dissociative-like experience with enough alcohol use. Um, increase in dopamine levels as well can lead to a pleasurable response and stimulate your body's reward system, which leads to some of the addictive components of it. It's rapidly absorbed uh, through the GI tract, max blood levels, usually after 30 to 90 minutes after consumption. Obviously, it depends what's ever in the stomach. If you have a full stomach, it's going to take longer for that to get into the small intestine and absorb. Empty stomach and absorb much faster. Oh, um, let's see, I think I talk about the metabolism a little bit later. Yeah, we'll get back to that in a second. Oh, just for fun, let's talk about hangovers. Um, so why do people feel terrible after they've drank a lot the night before? Um, well, you have some different metabolic pathways going on. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to refer to. Aldehyde hydrogenase, which converts acetaldehyde to acetate, gets maxed out. So what happens is you get a buildup of acetaldehyde, which isn't really nice to your body. Um, it's significantly more toxic than eth ethanol alone and will make you feel nauseous. Whereas ethanol, yes, will make you feel nauseous by itself if you drink toxic amounts of it. Um, but uh, acetaldehyde is going to amplify that effect more. Generally speaking, you don't feel the effects of acetaldehyde after a couple drinks because your body is um, moving it from this stage to acetate quite quickly, and acetate is getting excreted readily. Um, but if you build that up because you've maxed out your enzyme, that's where you end up with um, with the, the, the nausea, the headaches, etc. Um, the other side of it is dehydration, right? Al alcohol inhibits antidiuretic hormone, which increases diuresis. Uh, which is a little bit of a complicated thing. You're like antidiuretic hormone increases diuresis, or inhib inhibition of antidiuretic hormone increases diuresis. Wrap your head around that one for a second. Um, this can cause electrolyte imbalances and obvious fluid imbalances, which can lead to uh, also headaches and nausea and things like that as well, and augment the buildup of acetaldehyde. Immune system, effects not well understood. There's thought to be some sort of inflammatory cytokines. Um, there have been actually studies that show that NSAIDs do in fact help treat people who have consumed too much alcohol the next morning. Um, so ibuprofen uh, does actually have proven benefit. Um, some beverages may contain other chemicals as well. So if you're consuming a lot of a chemical and it's building up in your system, it could contribute to nausea. So, And there have actually been clinical studies on this. Again, this is all just kind of for fun, guys. Um, but that darker liquors, like, I guess, bourbons or brandies or whatever, um, are going to cause worse hangovers than lighter liquors like vodka 
or tequila perhaps, but um, yeah, I suppose that just depends on, on the product too. Um, I didn't find any studies saying that higher shelf alcohol has less hangover effect than cheaper alcohol. I don't think anyone's decided to do that research other than uh, on their own personal time. Okay, uh, alcohol acute effects, uh, blood alcohol con uh, concentration percentage by volume and the effects. I'm not going to test you guys on this. I get this question every year. Do I have to know all these? No, you don't. I don't care. A lot of this is mostly for fun. I'm not going to ask a lot of questions on ethanol um, or, or in alcohol in, in general. I'll tell you what I want you to know kind of at the end of these slides, but let's just roll with this for a second. So alcohol effects by volume. So most of the time in the immediate phases, you aren't going to see a lot of effects. And um, once you get to that approach, that point one, that's where you get some impaired, uh, significant impaired peripheral vision, um, glare recovery, and impaired reasoning and depth perception. That's the theory behind why legal limits are usually sub 0.1. So we have 0.8, 0.08 in Minnesota, um, and that's because it's thought that you can drive with some of these effects, right? But once you get to this, this is dangerous. Um, and more than that, emotional swings. Impaired reflexes, staggered walking, surge peach, erectile dysfunction for the men. Um, 0.3 to 0.5%. Um, significant CNS depression. And this is where people are getting close to death, um, especially if they aren't used to acute alcohol effects. Now, anyone who's worked in the ER will tell you that people can come in with like a 0 0.3, 0 0.4, even 0.5 something and be talking to you. And you're like, how on earth are you even standing. But it's because they've been consuming tons of alcohol for a long period of time. So it's a tolerance type thing, right? You build up tolerance. You can you can tolerate more blood alcohol percent by volume in your body than otherwise. Um, greater than 0.5 is generally thought to be highly significant and going to be associated with coma and death. But again, you can have people over 0.5 that are doing relatively okay. You know, if you put somebody who's not a, a, a drinker or very moderate drinker who drinks enough to get to that point, they're probably going to die if you don't reverse them or if you don't treat them immediately. So that's a significant poisoning and toxicity due to mostly to the respiratory depression that occurs from alcohol toxicity. And um, uh, the that if you do vomit up anything, you can be so severely depressed and via CNS depression or respiratory depression that you're gonna choke on your vomit or aspirate in your vomit and get a severe infection from that as well. All right, so what's the serving of alcohol? This is just generally, um, when we're looking at blood alcohol content, how many servings would correlate usually to a human being and what they're going to look at. So let's say three drinks for 175 pound, let's say male, relatively common weight, um, 0.06. And so you can kind of look at it that way. But obviously this is this depends greatly on the individual, right? Okay. Um, alcohol used to self-medicate. People drink alcohol to sleep. Um, is that effective? Well, um, actually, they've shown that alcohol does suppress the REM cycle, especially at high amounts, and the sleep resulting from alcohol consumption is not as restorative as sleep. Yes, it will be a sedative, and it will likely put people to sleep, but they aren't going to get that restorative functioning sleep that they need. Um, depression and anxiety, of course, people might use alcohol to self-medicate for this. Effects will be temporary, and usually over time, um, alcohol will worsen mental health disorders. So it's really important for people who are self-medicating with alcohol or being treated for early stages of depression or anxiety, tell them to not abuse alcohol. Now, ultimately, there are people who will be treated for depression that might consume alcohol moderately and be just fine. So I don't think it's a contraindication. What the problem is, is if you're trying to treat somebody for a new mental illness or you're tweaking their meds or dose adjusting them or whatever it might be, uh, you get into the situation where you have two, complete, two competing substances, right? You're trying to treat them with a antidepressant. You're also trying, they're trying to treat themselves with alcohol. They need to stop the alcohol, let the antidepressant do its thing, try and figure out, because it's a, it's a confounding variable that as a provider, you can't control as well. You can't control their alcohol consumption like you can their dose of their drug, right? So that's an important, I think, education point that like, let's cut out the alcohol for now. You know, if you have somebody who's a severe alcoholic patient and withdrawal is going to be a big risk, that's something that might need to refer them to an addiction specialist or develop sort of a tapering plan, something like that. But for the most part, um, you know, self-medication of alcohol is not going to be productive. It's going to, it's going to end up causing detriment to their mental illness. So we want to make sure we're approaching that, but also doing it safely.
people who are self-medicating are at high risk for dependence and addiction. So people who consume alcohol socially um, because, you know, their friends are doing it or they're out and that's what everybody's doing and it just makes them feel fun. They want to have a good time, whatever it might be. A um, lot less likely to get a, uh, a risk for dependence or addiction, whether it's you're medicating because you're depressed, you're sad about something, your life's not going as well as you want to, so you drink alcohol to escape. Just like with any substance, that's going to put you at much higher risk for long-term dependence and addiction than if you're using it like in a social situation. Uh, acute intoxication. So nausea and vomiting we talked about, disinhibited behavior, and of course the uh, the probably most severe consequences would be um, getting behind the wheel of a car or operating any doing anything that requires a high level of cognitive functioning and uh, sensory <clears throat> um, uses of, of all your senses, like driving, um, can be a really, really um, problematic if you have alcohol consumption on board. Obviously lots of fatalities and um, car accidents and incidents like that from people getting behind the wheel consuming alcohol. Chronic toxicity. GI related, uh, gastritis and mucosal damage will occur over time. Ethanol itself uh, can cause this, uh, but the frequent emesis and reflux people will get from chronically drinking ethanol. And also usually chronic drinkers aren't eating as much as they probably should. They're probably malnourished, which can contribute to um, some of the reflux as well. Um, may impair nutritional absorption, prevent adequate nutrition intake. So that's sort of a, it's, it's problematic because these people aren't <clears throat> consuming uh, nutrition like they should, and they're drinking, which impairs their ability to absorb the, the maximum amount of nutrition that they are consuming. So it's a, a double-edged sword, it's a, or it's a, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, you guys get the point, right? There's there's two problems here that, that are amplified by each other. Um, hepatic. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, so, of course, you can get liver toxicity over time. It takes a long time to destroy your liver. Your liver is a pretty resilient organ. Um, but at aldehyde buildup over time causes oxidative stress and cellular necrosis. It will be fatal if your drinking is not stopped. Transplant is really the only option when somebody's liver is severely cirrhotic. Um, <clears throat> however, you can't transplant somebody who's still drinking, or you shouldn't. Uh, so you have to make sure that they can get off the substance that they're abusing prior to the transplant, which can be difficult for some patients. Um, chronic toxicity, neurologic, uh, polyneuritis, tremors, uh, seizures, loss of brain mass. We talked a little bit about Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff's psychosis. Um, Wernicke's is your initial brain damage from swelling due to vitamin B1 thiamine deficiency and confusion, loss of muscle coordination and vision changes are the acute effects. Um, over time, if you do this long enough, you'll get Korsakoff psychosis, which is permanent damage due to um, chronic encephalopathy, which you can't form new memories. Um, you get schizophrenic like symptoms. Cardiovascular, um, hypertension, cardiomyopathy, CHF exacerbations, arrhythmias and strokes. Reproductive impotence for infertility, teratogenicity, fetal alcohol syndrome, of course. Um, there's lots of different data on this, and different countries have different guidelines on what's safe to consume. Um, and I've talked to providers, and some of them are like, yeah, you can have a glass of wine every day if you're pregnant without problem. And other providers are like, absolutely not. Don't even touch it. It's not worth the risk. Uh, there's some conflicting evidence on how much alcohol and how frequently you have to do it. And But I think, you know, for... For the sake of argument, you know, this is ultimate safety is to avoid it altogether during pregnancy. Uh, chronic alcoholism, psychological components, cravings, loss of self-control, toler tolerance contribu uh, contributes to this as well. Uh, physical dependence, high alcohol consumption means high risk for withdrawal, which means you're going to be more dependent on getting your alcohol to avoid withdrawal, which is the case of opioids as well. It's a very common common thing that people abuse a drug and they enjoy the effects for a while and then ultimately they get to the point where they need to just take the drug in order not to go into withdrawal. So they're just taking enough to, to get by. They aren't getting high anymore. Acute treatment for withdrawal. We talked about benzodiazepines. Haloperidol can be used for the, um, uh, the CNS related effects that can happen. So hallucinations. And um, long-term treatment, naltrexone has actually been shown to be an okay drug. It works um, by antagonizing opiate receptors, as we talked about earlier this semester. However, um, how that works with alcoholism isn't well understood. It's thought that consuming alcohol does have some effect on your natural uh, endorphins, so it releases that. So maybe by 
um, antagonizing those receptors, you're blocking that process somehow. And that's helping with people not getting as euphoric on alcohol as they might otherwise. Um, disulfiram is a product called Antibuse as a brand name. And it inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase, which makes it so that your body basically, if you drink any amount of alcohol, even like one beer, um, you're going to feel really sick. Uh, so it's a it's a deterrent. It's an oral drug that requires you to take it daily. So you know somebody has to be compliant with it in order to be successful. Now, Trexone is an oral medication, but it also comes as a long acting IM shot. So it's a little bit more easier to get somebody to to take this, and once they get the shot, they're stuck with it. Um, Disulfiram has to be consumed multiple times a day. Okay, uh, this is looking at symptoms of stopping alcohol and what you're looking at as far as withdrawal. So minor symptoms, anxiety, GI related, palpitations, anorexia, um, alcoholic halluc hallucinosis, uh, visual auditory tactile. Um, this usually resolved after about 48 hours. Um, withdrawal seizures is going to be seen around the one and a half to two day mark, somewhere in there. Um, generalized tonic clonic are usually the common presentation. However, it can occur as early as two hours after alcohol cessation, so you might see that much earlier as well. Um, delirium tremens is the, there's actually a beer called delirium tremens, but if you're wondering what it actually is, it's a word, it, it's a term used for all of these symptoms together. Um, and I like to think of delirium tremens as hallucinations, but also you're disoriented, there's, there's um, uh, cardiovascular effects that are substantial. And other things. This peaks at five days and can last up to seven days. So alcohol withdrawal takes a while. It's uncomfortable. Your biggest concern for um, complications is going to be your seizures. So that's going to be what you're generally trying to prevent. Obviously, a lot of this is uncomfortable, and that the, um, the hemodynamic instability can be problematic as well. But seizures are a big, a uh, big problem that we want to make sure we're, we're stopping that for sure. The rest of the stuff, if it happens a little bit here or there, it's not as big of a deal. <clears throat> Um, this is an inpatient alcohol withdrawal protocol that I took from Abbott. No, you don't have to know this for the test. Uh, let's see. I can't remember if this one is the CWA. This might be old. I might have taken the CWA. I can't remember if this is the mines or not. But basically, it's the same type of idea. So what happens is if you're a provider, you order this protocol, and it comes with all the drugs to you. And the nurse will then go in and assess the patient. So they'll go in and say, okay, anxiety. And it tells them all these things about anxiety. What score are they going to give them? They give them a score. They give them a score for how diaphoretic they are, how much tremors they're having, agitation, hallucinations. Total score, add it all up, and that's uh, so then you're even getting Q1 hour, Q2 hours, uh, Q2 hours times 2, and then Q4 hours after that. Depends on how, so that's basically deciding a frequency of the medication you're giving. Um, and again, this is the one using lorazepam. I just haven't changed this because it's not all that different with diazepam, it's just a different drug. Um, so, for example, for the first two hours, assess the score greater than 10, you give two milligrams every 30 minutes until the score is less than 10. That's pretty much the protocol, how you do it. A higher score is going to result in higher amounts of drugs more frequently until your symptoms are done. So we use Valium now. So your score goes a certain, you get a certain number, you give a certain number of Valium, and then you'd repeat that. Um, and you can do it IV or PO depending on access and, and how, how severe the patient is as well. But this is basically a protocol you can review. Again, not going to test you on uh, withdrawal protocols, but just so that you know benzodiazepines in general are used for withdrawal. And that's it for sedative hypnotics. Um, again, next week we'll talk about smoking cessation quick. We'll talk about geriatrics. Drugs of abuse, I will not have anything on the exam about it. If I can get it up... Uh, recorded before the end of the semester. I'll put it on there, but I might not do it until the summer. And, and either way, it'll be a bonus lecture. It's just for your reference, so for people who are interested. Now, what will happen before the end of this semester is a forum post, and I'll get that up within the next week with some references, and it's going to be about researching medical marijuana on your own and uh, answering some questions about it. It'll be very similar to last semester's um, PCSK9 inhibitor post, uh, and I think instead of doing a lecture on it, it's more interesting for you guys to read about it yourselves because it's changing so much and there's a lot going on nationally with it. It's kind of a hot button issue, as most of you guys are aware. So anyway, I'll have that up shortly, and you guys can work on that, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll have some cases posted as well for the final exam review. So um, with that in mind, again, we have two lectures next week. They're both <clears throat> not extremely long, so there will be some time for some review questions if you guys want to bring those to uh, 
lecture next week. Thanks, guys.